Good evening. Good evening. We continue our Lenten journey, and this evening the plant we focus upon is grass. Uh, we'll follow the order of prayer and preaching as it's printed in your worship folder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the murky depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are the enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden from you. May those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. O Lord, the Almighty God, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me, O God of Israel. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers, and an alien to my own mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me. And I am the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is recorded in Paul's first letter to Timothy, Chapter 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have, were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everyone, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In respect to our Lord, I invite those who are able to please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to the evangelist Mark chapter 11. The next day, after his entry into Jerusalem, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with our responsory. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. This evening, our catechism reading is from Luther's, uh, or from the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, along with Luther's explanation. Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. How is God's name kept holy? God's name is kept holy when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as the children of God also lead holy lives according to it. Help us to do this, dear Father in heaven, but anyone who teaches or lives contrary to God's word profanes the name of God among us. Protect us from this, Heavenly Father. We continue as we sing the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 783. Please be seated. sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, our Savior. This evening, we talk about something that is good, but can become bad or misused. The plant upon which we focus this evening is grass. Grass is something that is good. Maybe if you're like me, I grow tired of looking at the dried-up grass. 
I look forward to seeing the grass perking back up to life. And starting to fill in. We want grass to grow well in our yards. We want our yards to look nice. They especially look nice in spring and early summer, depending on the rains. But we also want grass to grow well in our pastures so that they're able to satisfy the livestock that's dependent upon them. They need this grass. It's also interesting how much difference one month can make watching from this picture to one month later and seeing how well and quickly it greens up. We even store up this grass so that livestock can be fed during those times when the pastures cannot keep up whether during drought or during the winter months. Wildlife also is dependent on grass and needs that grass for feeding. And maybe also some not so wild wildlife. Grass is also associated with places like Bush Stadium. I read an article from last August that talked about the grass in the Cardinals Stadium. When the new stadium was built in 2006, bluegrass <coughs> was installed. The bluegrass, though, struggled during the dry and hot times of summer. But then, last spring, they ripped out all the bluegrass and replaced it with Bermuda grass. The head groundskeeper shared that this tougher grass was paying off, as the field had already bounced back after three concerts. However, grass can become a problem. When it grows in places we don't want it to grow, like my garden. Last year, my garden was a disaster. The grass took over so quickly. In one week, it became a lost cause. The garden was already wet from rain, and then we were gone for two days to attend Faith's graduation at Old Miss. And then it was the weekend, so I needed to prepare and to conduct the worship service, and then more rain came, and I never caught up again, even when it started to dry. And believe it or not, there are actually some beets in there, and I did find them. But as it went on, it got worse. <laughs> it wasn't until November that I was finally able to clean it out and quickly before the next rains were going to set in. Oh, by the way, this is what a garden <laughs> should look like. This is my cousin's garden in Minnesota. She puts me to shame. So all of this leads us to look at what is occurring in tonight's text. God has given us the gift of money. Money can accomplish much good, providing food for eating, utilities to make our homes comfortable, homes which we can make into our own special places, vehicles that transport us and our possessions from one place to another, a means to support the work of the Lord, and so much more. Money serves as a way 
to pay a person for service that the person has provided, for example, as a wage for work, or for a product that a person has. Maybe that's clothing, shoes, furniture, technology, produce, or crops. Money was even useful at the temple. Perhaps you recall the widow whom Jesus observed soon after our text. In the court of the women, there were 13 containers that were shaped like an inverted megaphone. These containers received the donations of the worshipers. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting in their gifts for the treasury. He also saw a poor woman put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put all in all that she had to live on. What was different between this money at the temple and the money talked about in our text? The widow was making a contribution to support the work of the church. The money in our text, however, was being taken to satisfy greed. In the court of the Gentiles, the only part of the temple where non-Jewish people could come to worship and offer prayers, the Jewish religious leaders permitted a marketplace to be set up. Pilgrims coming to the Passover feast were uh, needed animals in order to offer up the sacrifices that were required. So vendors were manning pens with animals and money tables to make it more convenient for these visitors. Pilgrims were also needing to change their money because the annual temple tax could only be paid in local currency. And like today, I would suspect that there was also a fee to be paid for this service. The doves were needed for such purposes as the purification of women after giving childbirth, and the cleansing of people who had certain skin diseases. Things seem to have gotten so bad that the evangelist Mark comments that Jesus would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Apparently, people were using the temple courts as a shortcut from the city out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus then reminded the people, especially the religious leaders, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer and not, or a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You can imagine how this riled up the leaders. They began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him. Not to mention, he was affecting their bottom line. This is the danger that occurs when people use God's good gifts in the wrong way or in the wrong place. The Apostle Paul addressed this in our epistle reading this evening. People who want to get rich fall into all kind of temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I've often heard well-intentioned people say, money is a root of all kinds of evil. But this is not what Paul writes, and it's not what 
God means. After all, money is a gift from God. Instead, what Paul writes is, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. When money is not used as a gift from God, but there is this all-consuming lust for money, this is when money is used in the wrong way. The Jewish religious leaders were guilty of this abuse. Dr. Luther also found this attitude present in religious leaders of his day in the matter of indulgences. Indulgences at first were rare and used as a source of income on occasion. In the 13th and 14th centuries, they began to be seen as a way of removing actual guilt for sin. By the 16th century, they were being hawked as covering the sins of the living as well as those who were in purgatory. The common folk were buying into this. And so Luther was appalled. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance, he wrote. Those who preach indulgence are in error when they say that a man is absolved and saved from every penalty by the, pulp, the Pope's indulgences. John Tetzel, a notorious peddler of indulgences, even coined a little jingle. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Luther vehemently denied this. There is no divine authority for preaching that the soul flies out of purgatory immediately when the money clinks in the bottom of the chest. The more likely effect was avarice and greed. For Luther, who had recently come to this understanding of justification by faith, indulgences were wrong. Christ's blood, not money, purchased pardon from guilt. As the Apostle Peter declares, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so, your faith and hope are in him. This leads to a common expression. You can never have too much of a good thing. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil Company, the first billionaire of the United States of America, and once the richest man on earth, was asked by a reporter, how much money is enough? And he replied, just a little bit more. The idiom, too much of a good thing, means that even something that is generally considered to be beneficial can be harmful or undesirable, in excess. For example, eating too much chocolate can lead to adding weight and health problems, even though dark chocolate is generally considered to be a healthy food. Similarly, working too many hours can lead to burnout and stress, even though work can be fulfilling and a source of satisfaction. <coughs> It is a reminder that even the best things in life can be harmful if we do not use them in a God-pleasing way. Author Bernard Law Collier believes you can't get too much of the following things. Number one, energy and good health. Number two, 
sweet smiles, laughter, and hugs. Number three, friends. Number four, Ben Franklin, translated $100 bills. Mm -hmm. Number five, melodic music and Brazilian samba. Number six, well-kept flower gardens. Number seven, BMW cars. Number eight, home homemade Granada chocolate sauce. Number nine, punctual deliveries. Number 10, comfortable, grabby deck shoes. Number 11, dry, warm boots. Number 12, antipathy and aversion about breaking promises. Number 13, generosity. 14, respect. 15, tact. And 16, wit. Obviously, people's lists will be influenced by what they believe to be important and what is uh, or what has priority in their lives. Despite such diverse opinions about what you can't get too much of, there is one thing of which we can truly say. You can never to have too much of a good thing, and that is God's grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. May God's grace guide us in using his gifts in ways that are pleasing to him and that give glory to him. So, as you look out upon the green lawns and pastures in the coming weeks, May that rich green remind you of God and his rich grace, which he's offered us through his Son, and of which we can never get too much. Amen. Now may the peace and love of our God that pass beyond all understanding guard and protect your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We join in our hymn of response, What is the World to Me? It is number 730.
time we present our offerings to the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather, for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We join in the prayer for the world. Blessed, Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart. That by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we also join in Dr. Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, for I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Our closing hymn is Now the Light Has Gone Away. It is number 887. And yes, the first stanza is in German for Charlie's benefit. <laughs>
evening prayers are given.